Uh, my name is Alex Camilio. Uh, as I mentioned before, I am the CEO of the Agent Inner Circle, as well as a group called Service for Life. Um, I've worked in the real estate industry for almost 11 years at this point, um, and uh, I've done a whole number of different things to help agents um, consistently grow their practices over that amount of time. So I've helped over 15,000 agents. Uh, I've done so in a number of different groups. I'm also a, uh, an instructor with the Real Estate Technology Institute. So uh, before we get too much further in, I want to give a shout out to who is putting this on today, uh, the Real Estate Technology Institute and my good friend Craig Grant. Uh, who is the founder over there. I'm an instructor with RETI as well um, as some of the other things that I do. So uh, if you haven't checked that out already, definitely do so, reti.us. If you're looking for anywhere to uh, learn how to do marketing, technology, um, those sort of things, it is a great place to do so. And I know a lot of you are already members there. Uh, so definitely check that out if you have some time. So thank you to RETI for putting on this webinar series and, uh, and for having me on today. Um, as I mentioned, I've helped a bunch of agents over the years. I've built and bootstrapped uh, my own companies over the years, and I have spoken all over the country, 30 plus states. Uh, I'm going to be out in San Diego at NAR uh, speaking for them this fall. So I saw someone from San Diego in here, so please join us out there. Um, Esther asks, will we be receiving the slides? Uh, maybe. Um, I, you know, here's, here's the thing though, I am going to be giving away a letter, uh, at the very end for free that you can use, um, and go take and write into your business right away. So either way, you're going to be getting something at the end. Uh, I haven't made my mind about the slides yet though. So stay tuned on that. Um, and, uh, I might make them available. I don't always make my slides available, but, uh, but I might do so for this group and I'll definitely let everybody know about that. We're also publishing a blog article tomorrow, um, about this same topic on, uh, successfully writing sales letters, um, and letters to get, uh, business. So, um, all right, so we're going to dive on in, um, and we're going to be talking about letters to leads today. And as you probably saw, um, from the title slide, we're going to talk about how print is far from dead. And in fact, for a lot of agents out there, um, and a lot of businesses in general, we're seeing it as one of the most successful practices in terms of converting uh, leads and clients in what's going on today. Um, and for me, this is kind of a, an amazing thing to say. And, and I say that because I've been coding since I was 10. I mean, literally, you know, a long, long time coding now. Um, 25 years of coding at this point, and I've been into technology for an incredibly long time. So for a tech guy, someone that you would, people would call a tech guy to be out here saying, you know what, print is not dead. Uh, we've invested in it years ago at this point because we saw it making such a return. Um, it's kind of interesting to see some, you know, someone like myself who maybe isn't in the exact demographic you'd think about when it comes to print marketing. Uh, and writing letters, really embracing this concept. And the reason is because it works. Um, and there are some reasons that it's working well and that some of the top companies in the country are adopting print and even returning back to print. Um, so the way I think about it is this. Our inboxes um, right now, our, our email is absolutely overrun. Am I right on that? I, mean, I know for me, you know, even doing a great job keeping up with it, even having the tricks that Craig and I teach people um, on how to improve dealing with your inbox, I know it is still overwhelming uh, to, to deal with the inbox. Beyond that, I'm sure all of us are getting spam calls at this point. I know I am, um, and I'm sure that you are too. So our phones are overrun with spam calls and our social media news feeds feel absolutely like never ending. There's just content and content and content and content. And it's a lot more of the same stuff that's going on. So with all of this overrun, um, there's this concept in business uh, where it's called swim for blue ocean. And the, the notion is that when there are a lot of sharks in the water, they start chomping, the water gets bloody, you can't see. And if you can't see, you can't eat. You can't go after fish, you can't eat yourself. 
And at some point you've got to go out and get away from that pool um, to be able to stand out. And in many cases, print marketing is doing that right now. Letters are successfully working for agents because they're able to stand out um, in ways where uh, maybe you can't stand out in an email inbox when there are 45 other emails that come in that morning for that person. And as I mentioned, we're seeing some companies that are really picking up this tactic. And when you see major companies with their own research groups, with their own uh, studies and findings and so on, and huge money to spend on some of this marketing, when you see them making some big steps uh, toward print and going back toward print, you've got to sort of start wondering, is this something that really might work in my own business? Now, I mentioned some here. Amazon. Amazon up until a couple of years ago had never sent print marketing whatsoever. Guess what? They started sending print catalogs around the holidays every year to people, to some of their top customers, some of their top prime customers. Have, have you received any of those? Because I know I have the last couple of years and it's interesting to see them make that investment. Beyond that, you see Burger King, Heinz, Spotify. Um, you even see Warren Buffett making some investments into uh, magazine companies and things like that. So you, you notice, oh my God, all of a sudden, these huge groups are, are making investments into print because they're noticing that you can stand out um, if you do it correctly. Now, don't get me wrong, not everything stands out when it comes to print, um, but if you do it correctly, you can absolutely stand out and make a difference in your marketing and the number of leads and the amount of business that you're closing by doing so. Now, the way I like to think about this is that the best marketing doesn't feel like marketing. This is a great quote from Tom Fishburne. And the notion here is that it's about standing out in that inbox that we're talking about. Standing out to um, either past clients or neighborhoods that you're farming, right? It's about making sure that you don't blend in with what I like to call the car dealership ads. And we've all seen them. Because here's the thing. Okay. And I know, I know everybody here does this because I do this and everybody I talk to does this. Where do you sort your mail? Because if it's anything like me, it's over the recycling bin uh, or might even be over the trash. Because what you do is for me, sometimes I don't even make it in the house with some of the mail. I look at it and go, that's, nope, that's gone. That's trash. That's trash. That's trash. And it's gone before you ever open it, before you ever think about opening it. Um, a lot of those can disappear if you're not taking the right steps uh, toward marketing and, and doing that appropriately and getting that message to people. So there are some letters that work um, very well, and then there are some letters and st types of things that don't necessarily work quite as well uh, in terms of the types of stuff that you're going to send out. Now, I'll mention the letters that work well, and we're going to talk about um, all of these today and some strategies for how do you write all these how you tackle them, some ideas for going at them. Um, the letters that work well are farming letters. Now, this these can work very well to specific neighborhoods that you might want to farm or go after, um, or even specific lists or groups that you might be able to get uh, or email, or sorry, not email, to, or write letters, print letters too. So a lot of times you can work with uh, a local association, a community group, uh, a baseball team, a, there are all sorts of groups that will let, that will either mail on your behalf um, or let you mail uh, to folks depending on the permissions that they have. So farming letters can work very, very well. Next one that you want to look at is one-time referral letters. And these are the types of things where you're going to send a letter that's a one-time letter you might send on Thanksgiving, or it's a one-time letter um, that you might send on uh a birthday or a holiday, or it's a one-time letter you write just asking for a referral specifically. It's not something that you're going to send consistently over and over again. It's just something that you're, you're it's a total one-off. And the last is newsletters. Um, we've seen these work in the past. I see these work on an everyday basis as well as these sales letters that we're talking about. So the group I mentioned before uh, that I also run, Service for Life, um, does this a lot for agents. Now, we're going to walk you through doing this yourself. There is nothing today that is going to be a sales pitch at all. I don't do that with these RETI webinars. I just want to mention that my knowledge and expertise 
um, comes from doing this for agents for years at this point, as well as having a mentor and uh, predecessor that was one of the top um, <clears throat> top in the industry, top in the world when it came to copywriting uh, that mentored me when it came to this. So what we're going to get into in terms of the tactics of how you make each one of these letters work uh, are very specific to things that I see work for people on an everyday basis. We're going to walk you through the tactics for doing it. Um, and then as I mentioned at the very end, I'm going to give you a link to go download a letter that you can go use uh, and copy and, and use yourself. So Let's dive on into some of the tactics because every letter campaign that you write needs to have three goals, okay? And these are very, very simple goals, but you must have these three goals um, with any letter that you're working on. The first is to get it looked at. And we talked about this for a second when I said, where do you sort your mail, right? Over the recycling bin, just like I do. Well, you got to get it looked at but it's a step further from that and you got to get it open and actually read okay so getting it into people's hands is great you want to go a step further and actually get them to read it and then finally get a response from them i know this sounds simple but we're going to cover a lot of tactics today that you can use to make sure that you do all three of these things with every letter that you write and every campaign that you put out now, the first thing I want to mention is get it delivered and open, okay? Now, I say delivered very, very specifically here, okay? And this is, uh, I don't, this is not a conspiracy thing at all with the, the post office or mail. But when it comes to advertising mail, a shocking percentage of mail goes undelivered every year um, for a whole bunch of different reasons. Uh, so it's gotten a little bit better in recent years, but when it comes to the post office, there are study after study after study um, that show a sort of small or a not perfect uh, delivery. However, delivery actually improves when it looks personal and when you do some other things um, with the mail to make sure that uh, it stands out, not only to the person that you're sending it to, but to the postal worker uh, who is processing it through and making sure that piece of mail gets to the other side. Um, as I said, there's study after study about this and uh, it's kind of interesting to see, but the, the great part is that the same tactics that make sure you get it delivered are the same ones that make sure it gets actually open, that somebody takes it from the mail, it makes it through that sorting and they open it and they take some time um, before they decide whether they're going to read it or not. Now, things that'll do that, first of all, uh, first class versus bulk mail. If you can spend the extra money uh, to send something first class, it stands out, um, not only again to get it delivered, but also the person you're sending it to. Uh, live stamps versus the meter. So I know a lot of your offices or things like that might have uh, things where you can just get it, the stamp, not the, uh, I shouldn't say stamp, get it printed, right? The, the meter index, uh, index where you can get it printed. Not necessarily um, the best option because those live stamps, those real stamps on an envelope uh, stand out and make a difference when it comes to what, what people open. Um, individually or inkjet addressed. So what I mean by that is that um, you are having yourself or someone else that you're paying um, actually handwrite some of the addresses or you are doing some sort of label um, or inkjet address on the envelope itself so that it stands out and it doesn't look like it's coming. Look, you don't want it to look like it's either a bill um, or something that is advertising that they're just going to throw away immediately. So the more personal you can make it look, the better you're going to do and the better option um, that you're going to get. Now, the last two... Um, and no options, meaning sometimes I can see the benefit of using these things and these are certain tactics, but I don't tend to find myself falling into using these tactics consistently. Now, the first is the sneak up. This is um, an old school tactic where you uh, create a letter to look like people aren't really sure who it's coming from. You make sure it gets open. I don't necessarily love that to be the first impression when I'm sending something myself, but 
I have seen agents use it successfully, so I don't want to deprive you of having that in your tool set if you ever want to use something like that. The other one is called intimidating imprints. Now, this is something that might cost you a little bit more money and you've got to decide whether it's something uh, that's successful for you, but intimidating uh, might give it the wrong impression. And what that means is um, there, you can tell something is in the envelope or in the package that they are sending. The classic example of this is um, car dealerships using a key. They put a key in the package and you open it. Even when you know it's a key, you're like, I know it's a key and it doesn't go to anything. You still find yourself opening that package because there's the thing inside. The other things you can do with this are uh, things with like watermarks or something that stands out that gives you a little bit more texture when people are sorting through their mail that might be more likely to get it open. One of the great things you can do with intimidating imprints is if you want to send people a small gift. And this doesn't have to, have to be huge. A tiny piece of candy, right? A small, it doesn't matter. Something to make the package stand out um, and be a little different. I've even seen agents pluck um, their business card in there just to make it a little thicker, to make it stand out um, a little bit more. Now, you don't necessarily always want to use these last two, but like I said, I want to make sure that you had them in your tool belt in case it is something that you want to use. Now, once you've done this and you've made it personal looking so that people, it's going to get into their inbox, um, you or you know, into their mail, you're going to actually get it opened um, by them, right? And when I say inbox, I don't mean email. I mean, if they have an assistant that's sorting their mail by chance, right? You're sending it to a business address and they have an assistant that's sorting it. It needs to make it into the old school inbox and make it past that person um, who might be sorting mail for them. So you, once you've gotten it into that old school inbox, once you've gotten it into their hands and actually opened, now it's time to get people to read your content, okay? And there, we're going to cover a few different strategies that we use to do so. Now, it's all about creating copy that captivates. And I always ask, why does this actually matter to the person receiving it? And I think you always have to ask yourself that question whenever you're sending any sort of campaign, letter campaign, um, any campaign in general, but specifically with letters, this needs to be true because that when they open it, if you've got a split second decision as to whether they're going to keep reading that content that you sent them or not. Now, with the copy that captivates, you want to start with great headline, okay? And great headlines speak to three different things. So they speak to um, intellectual, empathetic, or spiritual value. And essentially, these are three different parts of the brain that interpret the content that is being delivered. So intellectual are words which are especially effective when offering products and services that require reasoning or careful evaluation. Uh, empathetic words that resonate with an empathetic um, impact often bring out profound and strong positive emotional reactions. And spiritual uh, have the strongest potential for influence and often appeal to people at a very deep emotional level. Now, if you want to see a tool, this is a, a free tool that I use from time to time. Uh, to check out headlines and how the words are uh, appealing to people, you can go to aiminstitute.com slash headline. Again, free tool, something I use from time to time to uh, check out headlines and, and brainstorm and come up with some good ones. But I'm not going to leave you hanging there. I want to give you some good examples and some good things to start with, um, and then some examples that we use that are within uh, this sort of structure. So first is great headlines. Um, let's build them around some of these structures because these are all proven to psychologically trigger some sort of response or emotion uh, within the person reading it that will likely get them to continue reading or respond in some way. Now, these are things like who else wants to? So you're psychologically grouping people together saying that other people have done this thing. And then ideally, if he wants to, is that thing that the person really values and, and wants um, as a result. Are you, okay? You're asking people to put themselves into a specific category. People always continue reading when you do that. How to. Now, this is something that is huge on YouTube and a lot of other places. 
but how-to type articles are always very, very interesting, especially if the person wants to learn about that topic. If you are, you can. Now you're qualifying people and giving some sort of exclusivity to what you're doing. Thousands, millions now, even though they thought they could never. And I'm sure you've heard and seen a lot of these used before. Now, there's a reason. It's because they work. We're not reinventing the wheel here. We are showing you some stuff that absolutely works for agents year in, year out, um, and has for a long time and continues to, uh, in some places, even better rates than it did in years past. Now, I, again, I don't want to leave you hanging. So I want to give you some headline examples of sales letters that we use that, uh, that we've written that we work with, um, agents on. So who else wants to own a piece of paradise? Who else? Right. You jump, you, you jump them in, you put them into that category. They're joining a set of other people that have done this thing. Why the smartest homeowners choose, right? You always want to see what the, the best people are doing when you're ever interested in doing something in that category. Why most home value estimates are bogus. You're putting out a big challenge, okay? How to sell your home for top dollar even without a real estate agent. We know where that all, or we know where that ends eventually with one. Um, but again, topics that have been used for years continue to work incredibly well. Now let's go on a few more. Uh, no sound warms the heart like the laughter of a child. This might seem a little out there, right? However, if you start thinking about life situations and the people um, and what they, you know, what makes people move, um, having a child is always one of those things. So sometimes your topic and your title, your headline is not necessarily about the thing you're, you're giving them, but you're putting them into a position saying, oh yeah, I just had a child or thinking about it or so on. People who put themselves into that category usually continue reading and continue consuming content. Um, and then guess who just moved into the neighborhood, right? Another great one. People always want to know who's in their backyard uh, and are curious about that. So uh, Angel says my mic is on mute. Can everybody hear me? All right. Everybody can hear me. Sorry. Uh. All right, loud and clear. Cool, cool. Just had to double check there. I saw that in chat. I was like, oh, how long have I been talking on mute? <laughs> We're good, though. I've, I have not been on mute. We're all set. Um, so headline examples that work. These are all things. These are all successful letters that I, that I have agents send, and they send with a lot of success using these types of headlines. So uh, these are all things that you might want to consider, um, you know, writing letters or uh, using letters that work very well within these categories using some of these headlines. Now, once we've created some great headlines, it comes down to creating that captivating copy, the letter itself, the body of the letter that gets somebody to read the entirety of your content and then eventually respond and do something that you would like them to. Now, this is a pretty uh, straightforward strategy. There are five parts to it, and this is something we use over and over. So first you write your copy, then you rewrite it, uh, then you send a mock-up, then you cool off for a little bit, and finally you actually send it out. Now we're gonna cover all of that in a little bit more detail here. So the first is some techniques to actually write your copy to begin with that first time. Now the first thing is I wanna just quickly go through and give you some, some strategies, some ideas, some things that have worked successfully for people who uh, use some of these tactics when writing a letter and in the concept of what kind of content and how they want to approach the letter um, and what they might be offering or asking or so on of the person on the other side. Now, the first is uh, intimidation. Now, this is... Uh, when I say intimidation, I don't mean you're trying to intimidate the person on the other side. But it's more the ex exclusivity and building exclusivity into the audience that you're talking to. So the first is, let's say you are hosting a home buyer seminar. Well, great. You want to host it to the whole public and as many people as you possibly can. But why not cap it out? Let's say there's a limited number of people that you're going to accept. Right? Don't think about a limited space to host people as a negative, 
as something like, oh my god, oh, I only have these many seats. No, I only have 10 seats available, right? At my home buyer seminar, make sure that you get your seat today. That's what we're talking about in terms of intimidation. Things that make people feel like they're getting into an exclusive group and things that will make people move in a more immediate sense. The other things that will go on in this category, most will buy, right? You will only buy if. You can only buy if. Only some can qualify. These are all things that are making people pre-qualify themselves demographically to say, yes, I'm in that group. I want to be in that exclusive group. And you'd be amazed how people will react when um, you give them that sort of exclusivity to put themselves into and join. Um, uh, yes, Judy asks, uh, would you please share the website again? Yes. So give me one second here. I'll just put it this in chat. I believe it's that. Let me go back here. Oh, headline. Let me delete that. Sorry about that. There it is. That's that second one there. Uh, second one in chat is the correct link um, in case you were interested in the tool to uh, check out some of the word values and associations that go with some of the content that you're putting out there. Um, you're welcome, Judy. Thank you so much. Uh, all right. So as we said, techniques to write your copy here, we want to start with, or, or as a, I shouldn't say start with one of the concepts that you can use is exclusivity and it works very, very well with letter writing. Um, so make sure you think about that when you're starting to include or starting to draft some of the content and some of the letters that you might want to put out. The next strategy that we talk about and uh, see used is to demonstrate return on investment. This is to sell money, not a discount. The basic and classic examples of this are things like uh, letters that... Um, oh, sorry about that. Hold on. There we go. Sorry about that. My apologies. It only sent to panelists there. It was defaulted to panelists. Thank you for letting me know. Uh, I should have the link in chat to everybody now. Oh, nope, it's the first one. It's the one with the actual link. There we go. There we go, perfect. All right, so the next one, as we said, is to demonstrate uh, return on investment. This is to sell money at a discount. Classic example of this that we see all the time is talking to renters about building equity in their homes, right? You're, you're saying, okay, the same money that you would be putting into renting at this cost now goes into equity and you start selling money essentially at a discount as opposed to the situation that they um, in before. Um, uh, Angela asked, what would you recommend for an expired listing? Um, that's a great question. So there's a few different ways that you can go toward um, expired listings. And we'll talk about a few of them actually coming up. One of the best tactics that you can go at um, expireds with is to uh, ask questions or to pose a question about what went wrong, essentially, or what changed, or why has it changed, or um, things of that nature that, uh, people or, or move people on and off the market. There's some direct things that you can go about. We'll get into that in a little bit more detail. I actually have some good examples of it, um, that I'll include once we get into the, uh, the question section, Angela, because there's a few different ways to go about expires, especially with how the market is right now today. So how you would have approached an expired listing, um, even eight or 10 months ago, uh, and how you're approaching a, approaching an expired listing today might be a little different because in a lot of markets in a lot of different places, there aren't many expired listings today. I mean, listings are just getting gobbled off the market so fast that the ones that are going off the market, there's a reason there's a either when we don't need to get into all, all the different reasons for that. 
Um, but in the market today, it's a little different going after expired than say a year ago. So what I might recommend in different markets will be a little bit different and um, approach it that way. So, and this might actually not even be the best times to look forward expired as a general category. Um, other things like uh, buyer fatigue or other things like people being afraid of where they're actually going to be able to move if they do sell. Those are the big challenges that people are facing um, right now when they're falling off, right? When people are expiring and not have, you know, things like that nature, there's a lot of that that's going on. So a lot of these letters have to do with, and, and I said it from the beginning, what's in it for them? Getting a concept of what is really affecting home buyers, home sellers in this market, and then targeting that specifically in some of the tactics um, that you're using when you're writing a letter for this current market. Um, next one, ego appeals. So keeping up with the Joneses is always a huge one. Um, there are some great tactics you can use within letters uh, talking about, you know, are all your friends, have all your friends bought a home and you're still renting, right? You might target a neighborhood with letters and maybe it's farming letters. Um, and maybe that area is a renter's market and you're targeting that specifically. One of the things is, hey, are your friends, have your friends all bought a home already? And you're, you know, and you're hesitant to, or something's holding you back, right? Those are the kinds of things that um, work very well when you're talking about things of keeping up with the Jones. But always keep in mind, people always want to keep up with um, the person down the block, down the street, at their school, at their job, whatever it might be. Uh, and there's a lot you can do to appeal to that when you're writing letters to people. Um, the next is techniques to write your copy is uh, a strong guarantee. So number four here is, now these are basic money back guarantees, uh, refunds and keeps the premiums, redundancy, trial offers, all that sort of stuff. Um, everything from free consultations um, that people have offered in the past. Uh, or um, free meetings or free things of that nature. We've even seen brokerages and things of that nature go as far as guaranteeing they'll buy someone's home. We're getting into that kind of market again where people are starting to guarantee we'll buy a home you know, at whatever price within um, X amount of time just because the market has gotten uh, to that point that people can start offering these guarantees. So it might not be the best for everybody, but it is something, like I said, I want you to have these tools in your tool belt. The last technique that I want to mention, and this is something that I believe that you can use with all of the other ones that we're talking about today, is to tell a story. And the truth is, great storytelling sells, and it sells incredibly well. I always get a question, though, um, from folks, and it's usually around this point, and, or maybe a little bit forward, but, but it's people ask, you know, how long should these letters be? How long should my story be? I got to say that um, is kind of an interesting thing. My, one of my mentors said to me, a gentleman named Craig Fort, um, who he was friend, he was actually best friends with uh, Dan Kennedy and Craig Proctor, and they wrote a ton of stuff. In fact, if you read any of Dan Kennedy's um, uh ultimate sales letter or things of that nature. Uh, he talks, he actually talks about Craig Ford and his success in letter writing um, and newsletter writing within um, real estate. Now, great storytelling sells. And what Craig said to me, and I asked him this same question about length and, and how long the ideal length is. And he says, you know, Alex, um, there's no length on interesting. And I thought about it for a second. I said, wow, you know, I think you're, I think you're right, Craig. I think that's true. He said, well, think about it. You know, you read a book. If the book um, is exciting or intriguing or it attracts you right from the beginning, you can find yourself reading chapters and it feels like time has just flown by. But on the other hand, if you start reading something and it is boring, it doesn't interest you, no benefit to you, there's nothing to it. I'm, I'm gone. I'm, I'm moving on. Right. And I'm, I'm away from that topic already. The same thing is true in any sort of writing. It's true for our blogs. It is true for our sales letters, it's true for our newsletters. It's true for anything that we're putting out for content, which is that, um, if you're, if you're great at storytelling, 
And if you can be intriguing and interesting to people, there's not necessarily an immediate length that will turn people off if you're doing it correctly. So uh, keep that in mind and go out and write and write and write and write and write and practice. Okay. But we're not going to stop there because as I mentioned before, writing your copy is actually just step number one. You want to get all that content out. You want to use some of the strategies we talked about earlier and get all your content out and write a sales letter to the specific audience um, that you want to go after. Now, once you've written some of that content, once you've told a great story, once you've offered them something that, um, you know, maybe they can't get elsewhere or just that it's better than they can get anywhere else. Um, now it's time to rewrite for strategy. So first of all, rewrite without constraint. We talked about this, which is make sure that you are not putting limits on yourself in terms of the amount of content that you're starting with uh, and working from to pare down. Next thing is I want you to frustrate your English teachers. I mean that wholeheartedly. Um, the way that we read and the way that we interpret content is not always necessarily the best when it is written in proper uh, grammatical form. The reason is that we tend to do a better job interpreting information when it is more like how we talk than it is how we actually write when it comes to prose. So when it comes to sales letters, don't necessarily get hung up on being over the top when it comes to uh, grammar and run on sentences and ellipses and, um, and starting sentences. Uh, things of that nature, which normally in a lot of contexts, and this is something where I had to retrain my, I mean, I really, I had to retrain myself on this because for years I wanted to write the way that I was taught in school to write. Um, but the reality is, is that it doesn't work as well when it comes to writing sales copy, uh, because we don't necessarily interpret information, uh, when it comes to sales, the same way we would, uh, other media. Now, the next thing is to use graphic enhancements. And I don't mean your logo and your picture and all those sorts of graphics. What I do mean are things like dashes, dots, bullets, ellipses, um, all of those little extra things that you can do, bold text, things that make uh, your text stand out or sections of the text stand out. The reason for text standing out like that is what we call a double readership path. So um, it, it's kind of funny when you think about this because there are two types of people when, when reading content. The first is people who will start at the top and read every bit of that from top to bottom when they're reading something in order, okay? And then they'll go back and look for chunks or other pieces or so on. Then there's a second type of person which will read piece, 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 Okay. And then if they get through all of these pieces, one, two, three, four, then they'll go and it interests them. Then they'll go back and they read paragraph, 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 paragraph. Now, let me ask you, are you number one or are you number two? Let me know in chat. Um, are you number one? You read everything top to bottom first, and then you go back. Or do you read section, 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 and then all of it, if it interests you? All right, we got some twos. We got a one, one, two, one, two, one, two, right? So that's what we call a double readership path is you can see very clearly that there are two types of people in terms of how we read content from top to bottom. Um, the real estate industry might lean a little bit more on one side, but it, either way, who the audience you're going after does two different things. So your goal is to create um, create what's called a double readership path. And what that means is you're going to have bold or highlighted or standout sections inside of your letter that allow people to read each one of those section headers to figure out if they're interested in. And the trick is that you want to go back to what we talked about in headlines and figure out ways to start each one of the sentences and each one of the sections of the letters that you're writing 
with one of those standout headlines that people go, oh yeah, I'd like to read that. Oh yeah, I'd like to read that too. Okay, this is interesting to me. Let me go back to the start and read all the content. Because if you do that successfully, the people who are reading all of it will make their way through the entire set of copy. Um, because usually if you're doing that well, it is interesting to them. Um, so this is a very, very, uh, uh, we'll call it master level technique, but you want to make sure that, um, so Denise says, can you show the headline slide again? Yes, I can go back and do that. Uh, give me one second here. We'll finish this slide and then we'll go back and do that. Um, so that double readership path is one of the keys when you are writing sales letters and writing copy that you want to make sure that people read. Um, and get through and then ideally respond to. Now the last, when it comes to rewriting for strategy, is to say it again and again and again and again. And guess what? You just say it in different ways. Because the interesting part is we don't, as humans, we don't necessarily retain information the first time that it is presented to us. In fact, a lot of times, the way we best retain information is when it is presented to us in different ways over and over and over again. So you don't want to say the same thing, use the same words over and over again, but you absolutely want to convey the same messages multiple times. Don't feel like you're necessarily being redundant. Now, obviously, you don't want to drone on and on and on forever, but as I said, say it again and again and again because that redundancy can actually be helpful when it comes to a sales letter and making sure that you get your content and your point across because you never know um, how you're phrasing it and the angle that you're taking, how that will attract or uh, resonate with the correct person. All right, so let me go back here. All right, so that is the great headlines. So aminstitute.com slash headline. I'll put that in chat one more time here. There we go. Um, and as I said, these are another, just so you can take a quick look at some of the headline examples and things that work um, very, very well when it comes to writing those headlines or using these to capture people even into the content that you're writing down the page. All right, so let's move on here uh, because once you've rewritten for strategy, like we talked about, the next thing you want to do is rewrite for style. Okay. Now there are two tools that I mention um, and recommend using when it comes to improving the readability of your con content. Uh, one of which is readable.io. Um, that's readable.io. It's a great tool to check out. I know they have some free options. The other one is Grammarly. Um, I didn't mention that on the slide. I probably should have, but uh, Grammarly is something that we use uh, internally to make sure that um, we're doing a good job writing content. Now, one thing you want to keep in mind, as I said before, is that you do want to frustrate your English teachers at some point. So you don't want to necessarily accept all of the things that Readable or that Grammarly mention when it comes to improving your content. The other thing that you want to mention uh, that I'd love to mention here is that when you write your content, you want to make sure that you are writing a letter that is going to be read at a sixth grade level, okay? There's a reason that political campaigns do that. There's a reason the top advertising agencies in the uh, country do that. You want to make sure that you are appealing to the widest audience, and it's not just about the widest audience. It's also about making something easy to read, because if something is too complicated, it's just too over the top, um, people might sort of bow out and say, you know what, I, I don't want to, um, it's been a long day of work. It's been a whatever. I don't want to, you know, think too hard right this second. So between the wide audience, um, as well as making it easy for your audience to read, ideally you want to come in around that sixth or seventh grade level uh, when it comes to the content that you're writing. And these will actually grade you uh, and give you some great ideas when it comes to um, you know, what level content that you're writing at and, and how you might want to change some of those words or some of those phrases that you're using. The next thing is to extend your headline. So we, we talked a little bit about using that in the body of content. Um, what I mean by that is, let's say we're using one of the who else wants to, okay? 
who else wants to um, find their home in paradise, right? Is your paradise X, okay? That's a, what we call continuation of the headline. You're using something that we know is a proven headline to lead into the content and the body um, that you are writing for style. And it's a, a very good one-two punch when you're able to set it up that way. Next is to be entertaining, uh, whether this is dropping jokes, um, whether this is telling a great story and, you know, maybe a joke about yourself and some funny experience that you might have had. Um, the more entertaining, the better, uh, especially if you can build up that as a reputation. It tends to get people to open your content over and over again. The next is to appeal to the senses. So instead of um, just, can you imagine yourself in this home? It's, can you imagine smelling the lilacs in the backyard? Okay. Um, instead of, uh, can you imagine yourself in this home? It's, can you imagine entertaining guests in this wonderful kitchen? Okay. Those are the types of things that when you appeal to the sense, smell, touch, taste, right? Those sorts of things that you make people stand out and actually imagine the situation, imagine themselves being there. That sense, if you can evoke some sort of call to the senses. Um, in fact, we did a, a great article on writing property descriptions. We talk about all of this a lot in, uh, in depth. If you want to check it out, um, I'll put the link to the blog in here. And uh, if you just search uh, property descriptions, it'll come right up. Um, but we talk a lot about appealing to the senses. If you can do that, you're more likely to make a uh, connection with that person, as well as they're more likely to store that information for a longer period of time. Um, so the more you can do to appeal to the senses, the better. Last is to use impact words um, when it comes to some of these style tactics. Now, impact words are, you know, things that really, really stand out, okay? Now, when I say impact words, I mean uh, action-type words. Explosive, right? Those are, those are impact. They're, you're making an impact with that word. You're calling a, an imaginative sense to that uh, person and uh, a thing that is actually happening. Those types of impact words are, uh, are really, really key. Readable actually does a great job um, highlighting some of those and giving you some options uh, for those as a tool if that's something you want to check out. And the last is be authentic. Um, and I, I always, it always frustrates me that I have to remind people of this, but be you when it comes to these. You know, if, if, you try to write something that's too far outside of your style and who you are as a person, it reads true. Um, so you don't want to go way, way outside your ballpark. But um, keep in mind that, you know, it needs to be a balance of the things that work well for you as well as the things that are authentic to you and the types of content that you want to put out for people. Now, we've talked about writing your content. Um, last thing I want to get into is actually getting it responded to. Because it's all well and good to get it into people's homes, to get it open, to get it read. But if they don't actually respond to it, well, our, well all is for naught, right? So we're going to talk about some specific tactics that we use to get people to respond to your content. And, and these are just going to be quick. These are things like limited availability. So we talked about that before, but you know, there are only 10 seats at my home buyer seminar. I only have, you know, five people that I can work with at any given time. And, you know, I'm at four right now. Um, you'd be amazed what those limited availabilities can be. Uh, deadlines for people to respond by. You know, I'm offering this report, I'm offering this specific help to people, but I'm only doing so for this month. Those are things that will get people to respond because it's, they know it's not something they can just get at any point in time. Um, some sort of a discount or bonus or gift or something for the first people to respond. You know, I'm doing this thing. The first 10 people that, that sign up for this class get X as a bonus. Okay. Those sort of things get people to move. Sweepstakes and contests. Um, this is kind of an interesting one. Any sort of sweepstakes and contests. Uh, now, 
Let me back up here because I don't want a bunch of people in chat to immediately go, that's illegal for us to do. We've covered this before. Um, there are some legal items within sweepstakes and contests. However, um, it is that you specifically can't give away uh, money if people are paying to get into your sweepstakes. Meaning, um, if someone is giving you a dollar to get into your sweepstakes, right, buying tickets from you, then yes, you, you cannot, that is a lottery, you cannot run that. However, if you're doing it for free and you're doing it as a giveaway, that is totally legal. You are, you are welcome to give gifts um, and do contests for gifts as long as they're non-monetary related contests. So keep that in mind because those are absolutely things that get people to respond. Um, you know, drop your name in a bucket for a, a giveaway, or we're giving away X things, right? Keep that in mind. Giving away an iPad, drop your name in a bucket. Um, just something to keep in mind as another option, another tool in your tool belt that you can use in these letters to spark some immediate action. And the last is you really want to make sure you make it easy for people to respond. Tell them exactly what to do, where to go, how to respond to you. Um, and don't, here's the other thing that's kind of interesting. People are a lot more likely to respond if you give them a way to do so where they don't feel like they're necessarily going to be sold to immediately. Meaning, call my cell phone to get my free report sometimes doesn't do as well as call this vo automated voice line and leave your address and I'll send you a report or leave your email and I'll send you a report. They work very differently because people want to, they don't want to feel like they're going to get sold to um, in, in the immediate sense. So not necessarily making them do that, uh, can up your conversion rates when it comes to driving leads and driving traffic. Okay. Now we've talked about getting it responded to and some good tactics that you can use to do so. Um, we are almost there because after you're done writing, after you're done rewriting, after you're done, including all the things to get it responded to, um, we're going to go through the very last steps, which are to mail a mock-up. You're going to cool off and then get second opinion. So mail the mock-up as though you were sent, send it to yourself as though you were sending it to somebody uh, in your audience. Receiving it that way yourself um, days later will oftentimes give you a very good idea of the experience that somebody is going to have when they get your letter. You also want to give yourself a little bit of time to cool off. Now, this is at any point in time in your writing. Um, it is great to take some time away, come back with a fresh perspective and make sure that, um, that you know, you've uh, edited after a little bit of time and taking some time to cool off. You also want to get some second opinions. Now, you don't want to go way over the top. And, and we all know that we have some friends that maybe we shouldn't get a second opinion from because it'll just be a change everything about it and so on. Um, but send it to some people who are just friends of yours that might fit the category that we're talking about of the audience that would be receiving this and say, Hey, what do you think about that? What do you think about receiving this from me? And if you can get an honest opinion, um, those people are the best, those friends of yours, that will give you the honest opinion say, yeah, you know, this is cool. Or I might've done this, or I look at it this way or whatever it is. Those that's always some good feedback to get. And then once you've done that, it is time to go mail. Now I mentioned EDDM, that is everyday direct mail. The post office does a great job of letting you target very specific neighborhoods or groups, or areas that you want to go after um, and doing so very inexpensively. But I want to talk for a second because the lead quality isn't necessarily the same, okay? Between um, everyday direct mail, and then maybe sending to the top of your list. Okay. What I mean by that is this, um, you can absolutely go out and use the tactics we talked about today for farming. We talked about this at the beginning, there are the different types of letters that work, but what we see time and again are that the best tactics for these letters are to either send a uh, a one-time, a referral style, or one of the other types of categories that we talked about today, letters to your audience that is maybe not the general populace. Because the, the thing is, is that 
the higher you move up the pyramid that I'm showing here, the better you're going to do with these letters that you're sending out. So at the bottom, it is the general population. That is, um, you know, if you just happen to send everybody in a city, okay? You go a step further and you say, okay, fertile niche markets. Maybe I'm targeting everyday direct mail, okay, up a level or up to fertile niche markets. I'm targeting everyday direct mail and sending a renter's letter to a neighborhood of renters, okay? Um, oh, I should have changed my name here. Eric, it is Alex Camilio here today, but I appreciate you saying great information. Uh, and for those folks that joined us late here, uh, I'm just about to give away a letter that you can download and use yourselves. Um, so if you hang with us here for a second, uh, you're going to be getting that as well. Now, what we talked about fertile niche markets. That's more like everyday direct mail where you can pick a specific neighborhood or a specific target, FISBOs, expireds, things like that, and target them specifically. Now we move up. These are uh, transaction leads. These are inbound sign calls, online listings, um, inquiries, ad calls, things like that. Sending follow-ups or letters as follow-ups to some of these folks uh, is a really great way to go about um, what you're doing. And then get up to the top of the list. Okay, and this is this is what we call the power list. Okay, this is the the top, um, and then even above that, the top twenty percent. And that power list are uh, those who know you well, maybe your past clients, your family, your friends, your acquaintances, and then your top 20% are the people who are really your fans, the people who respond to all your stuff on social media, the people who you know will open that content um, when you're sending. And the better job you can do and the more targeted that you can be toward moving toward the top of this list, the better that you're going to do. Now, I know a lot of agents have gotten into a situation where maybe there's a lot of these people on the power list, right? Or even within some of these niche markets that you haven't followed up with in a while. That it's been a year, a couple of years, right? You have some of these people on a list, but maybe it hasn't been um, recently. You want to start following up with these people in the future. So that's what we're actually going to give you today as a bonus um, and as a sales letter is what we call the reacquaint uh, sales letter. And this is to essentially send to an audience like, say, those past clients, friends, family, past colleagues, things of that nature who you might not have talked to in um, a given amount of time, six months, a year, whatever it might have been. This is a letter that I've seen agents use with a ton of success. Uh, to go and use this template to uh, to reacquaint themselves, start showing up in people's um, mailboxes again, and uh, and then be able to really start doing some great, great sales campaigns from it going forward. Because it's always weird to just send a letter to the top of your list if you haven't sent them a letter um, in a long time. So we want to give you a very, very easy way to do that and a template to do that. Um, I will put that in chat as well. There you go. Um, so that is in chat um, as well. Absolutely. So we have uh, Whitney and Constance saying great info. Thank you. Eric also said great info. Thank you so much. Um, thank you to everybody who has joined us today. The link is there in chat for the folks that uh, that want to uh, go and download the template letter. Um, I will mention my name is Alex Camilio, uh, the CEO of the Agent Inner Circle with agentinnercircle.com. Um, if you haven't already, you should definitely join the Agent Inner Circle Facebook group. Uh, I'll put that link in chat as well. We're getting a lot of thank yous. Oh, geez. Thank you, everybody. Marianne, Marianne, Saeed, Esther, Diana, Sherry, Claudia, Lisa, Audrey. Thank you so much to everybody. Constance, you're using Savvy Card? Yeah. So my former partner, business partner from uh, Barcode Realty, Warren Dow, is the VP at Savvy Card, as well as my good friend, uh, Chris LeBurge. You will see Chris um, and uh, uh, my good friend, Chris LeBurge and Warren Dow both work at Savvy Card. 
and our I, Warren and I went to high school together. Uh, so I have some really good friends over at Savvy Card. So uh, that's so funny to to see that in chat. I love seeing that. Um, uh, Elizabeth says, what about a return address? My husband received a letter from a realtor that had no return address. Um, so here's the thing, um, Elizabeth. So that is what we were talking about earlier called the sneak up. Okay. And it is a tactic that we've seen agents use, um, successfully for years because you're curious who the heck sent me this mail right now, if that person includes a gift, and, and they don't, they sneak up on you with a gift of some sort. Well, that's great. But if they sneak up on you with a sales tactic, it might not be the great, greatest option. So it really comes down to the, the tactic that you want to use um, when it comes to that. We have seen agents do that in the past. We have seen some success with that. Uh, I am always cautious about using what's called the sneak up when you're putting out any sort of sales tactic. Um, but like I said, there are ways to redeem yourself, right? Surprising somebody with a gift isn't that bad of a surprise. Surprising somebody with a sales letter that has nothing to do with anything to help them, totally different story. So just kind of keep that in mind um, when it comes to using a tactic like that. Uh, Angela, hello. I don't know if you're still here, but thank you. Angela says, thanks, Alex. Great info. Great to see you. Absolutely. You're welcome, Elizabeth. All right, so for everybody still here, I put a final link in chat. Um, this is our Facebook uh, private group. Uh, if you request access over there, I will get people approved. Um, we are having some great conversations in there every day, as well as we have totally free content uh, that we give out on a weekly basis to help agents improve in their business. And usually they have some sort of download, handout, giveaway, takeaway, something that you can use uh, that day to improve your business. All right. And before we close this down, I know we're already after five today. Uh, before I close it down, I do just want to mention um, uh, Craig Grant and the Real Estate Technology Institute for putting this on today. Um, we absolutely always love being here. I love being an instructor with uh, the Real Estate Technology Institute. Uh, so thank you to everybody um, for joining. If you haven't checked that out, reti.us. Uh, great, great site. There are literally thousands of videos um, to learn technology in your real estate practice. So definitely check that out. Uh, absolutely. Thank you to Craig. Um, and we are going to close it down today. All right. Once again, my name is uh, Alex Camilio, CEO of the Agent Inner Circle. Um, I appreciate everyone spending their time with us today. A uh, big shout out to my good friend, Craig Grant, uh, for putting these on. And uh, if you have any questions, definitely give us a shout and uh, we're always happy to answer them. All right. Thank you, everybody. Have a wonderful afternoon. As always, best wishes for your success.